Hello everyone, uh, and today we're going to uh, go over the third section of principles of patient assessment, which is about the clinical decision making and uh, symptom assessment. Okay, so let's start with the scenario. A patient returns for a clinic visit to follow up on her diabetes. Her diabetic control is poor according to her hemoglobin A1C result. However, she reports that she has been feeling fine and her home glucose tests have all been pretty good. On further inquiry, she's certain that her sugars are really never above 10. Though your lab test result would suggest otherwise. So you have a patient with uncontrolled blood sugar, it looks like. I mean, with elevated hemoglobin A1C. And elevated hemoglobin A1C is a sign of poor glucose control. However, when you check with the patient, she mentioned, she mentioned that her glucose control, like, is never above 10, her blood glucose level. Okay, so what do you think? Generally, if there is a high hemoglobin A1C, it should be associated with like maybe elevated hemoglobin, uh, elevated glucose. So what is the reasons for that? So I'll let you think about it. You can pause the video, think about it. And get back so maybe there are many reasons so maybe assuming that the patient is like is monitoring her blood glucose and her blood glucose is really never above 10 so maybe there's an issue with his glucometer right like the the machine like can you check with the patient if he's actually measuring it correctly uh, measuring the blood sugar correctly uh, 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 Ask her to bring the machine in to see if it actually gives uh, good results. If it's uh, uh, if there is any thing like uh, how often she monitor her blood sugars and so on. That's one thing. One other thing to let's say her blood sugar is actually under control. So you need to think outside the box. Is there any reason? Is there any cause that is there any problem the patient might be having? that causes false elevation of hemoglobin A1C. So that is about thinking about outside the box. So in this case, you might look into primary literature, see if there's any causes of elevated hemoglobin A1C could be elevated. One of them is like iron deficiency anemia, severe mm. ones, sometimes associated with elevated hemoglobin A1C. Okay, so in order to make a clinical decision making or a clinical judgment, you need two things. Pattern recognition, by comparing the information you get to your knowledge to develop a definition. What does this mean? Hemoglobin A1C is a well-known marker for glucose control. So generally, if a patient has high hemoglobin A1C, we say poor glucose control, right? Uh, knowing the patterns that what you learn in school, in your clinical experience, will, 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 will allow you to make a definition about the condition the patient is having or the problem you are dealing with. Second one is critical thinking. Because critical thinking and also thinking outside the box is very, uh, is very essential for clinical judgment. So what's critical thinking? There are many definitions in literature about critical thinking. So one of these is, is, is the process of pulling together the complex pieces of patient's illness, including their history, examination, lab results, radiology results, and illness course toward an effective endpoint that allows for a guided logical approach to treatment. Simply pulling together the data that you need in order to make clinical judgment. And there is more. It's not, not only just pulling data. Data is available everywhere. 
electronic health records, net care, other electronic uh, records or paper records. That are the, but the most important thing is you need to ask what questions, what information do you need? So assessing a complex clinical scenario to define the right questions and collecting and analyzing the appropriate information to answer those questions. So before collecting the data, you need to define the right questions. Do I, what do I need? So a patient comes with diabetes. You need to look, one of the things that you need to look for is hemoglobin A1C, right? If they are not there, you need to ask for it, okay? Other definition is the ability to collect and assimilate data, weigh the importance of the data to decision making, and compare it against known patterns. This is what I told you pattern recognition in order to make a definition to come up to conclusions and determine the actions. So again, for clinical judgment, you need pattern recognition and critical thinking. Okay. In other words, in order to have a clinical, to make it a clinical decision, you need patient information, full information. I will add full relevant information, okay? That's relevant to the topic, the, the condition, the, the, the issue that you're dealing with. Need clinical evidence, best possible evidence. We say best possible evidence because not in every area in, in medicine does have huge strong evidence, level 1A evidence, right? So get the best possible evidence of the evidence for use the certain medication is a certain condition given the patient circumstances right which is the patient information and another important piece that sometimes people forget about you need knowledge of the disease drug and general principles of therapies and assessment which is a background knowledge right so for example if you're assessing an adverse drug reaction for a medication and one of the questions that you need to ask yourselves is it biologically plausible that this medication or this drug caused this adverse drug reaction sometimes when you look at the evidence you find nothing maybe this patient is the only patient in the whole wide world that had this adverse drug reaction but there's a drug mechanism of action you are the drug expert and you're saying, okay, does the drug mechanism of action justify that this medication could cause this? Like if the medication, for example, if the drug is immunosuppressive, suppressed immunity, if the patient presents with infection, probably, maybe, could be the cause, right? So when you're doing assessment, you need to do pharmacotherapy workup. In the previous video, we talked about like collecting the patient history right now we're starting assessing the patient so one of the things is think about indication right so what what are the these are the kind of type of the drug related problems related to indication unnecessary drug additional drug therapy is required patient has a medication with no indication or has an indication with no medication uh, something related to efficacy maybe the dose is too low ineffective drug, incorrect drug or drug product. Adherence issues, maybe non-adherence or over-adherence, taking too much of the drug. Safety, adverse drug reactions. Dose maybe is too high. Drug interactions. And maybe when you're just checking a prescription, there's no DRP identified. DRP means a drug-related problem. Drug therapy is appropriate for the specific patient and just ongoing monitoring is required. Okay. Okay. Let's start with, uh, let's uh, keep going with another scenario. DD is a 44 female, came to your pharmacy requesting something for her headache. Okay. So patient presents to you in the pharmacy, she has headache, right? So how do you assess that? Headache is a symptom here and it could be an illness. So we need to know how to assess that, okay? Patient might need acetaminophen, epiprofen, naproxen, 
But before doing that, before do, doing decisions, making decisions, you need to have proper assessments. And here we come to the symptom assessment. So this is the approach of symptom assessment. Here's how I approach uh, a patient presenting with a symptom, okay? So first, you, you check the history and presentation. You can ask the patient uh, or the caregiver uh, focus questions specific to the symptom, okay? And try to mix between open-ended and closed-ended questions. So open-ended questions, uh, it's the question that let the patient des describe what they're having. So can you please describe your symptoms? Uh, uh, Closed-ended questions, sometimes you need to ask specific questions, for example, to identify red flags. Did you have high uh, fever? Uh, did you have stiff neck? And so on. So, so the answer could be a yes and no, right? Uh, you need to mix between open-ended and closed-ended questions. And uh, then you can ask questions related to SCHOLAR, which is an acronym that helps you collect information regarding the symptom. Well, I'm going to talk about it in the next slide, SCHOLAR, okay? Remember that. Uh, you combine that also with relevant physical findings, lab tests, investigations if available, right? While you're asking questions, you need to identify red flags. Red flags, these are some red flag symptoms, signs that may uh, uh, warrant referral to either the emergency department or the patient doctor and so on. When you are assessing a symptom, also you need to see if there's any drug related or disease related causes for that symptom, okay? So what's color? So it's an acronym. S C H O L A R. So S stands for symptoms. So what symptoms the patient is experiencing? Okay. Characteristics, and these characteristics could be uh, uh, qualitative and the quantitative description of the symptoms. Okay, how severe is your headache? Right, something like that on a scale of one to ten. Okay, uh, constipation, diarrhea. Uh, like how often do you go to the washroom? Uh, bowel movements, the number of bowel movements the patients have. History. What the patient was doing when he experienced the symptom. What the patient was doing when he experienced or she experienced the symptom. O. Onset. When the symptom started and for and how for how long? Started two days ago, three months ago. That's also very, very helpful in order to identify the symptoms. Location, which could be relevant to some symptoms, right? So, how can you describe your headache? Is it around your head and so on, right? If you have abdominal pain, in what area and so on. Aggravating factors. What worsened the symptom? Okay, like sunlight, eating chocolate, eating spicy food, aggravating factors. Remitting factors. What the patient did to relieve the symptoms. Also, this is another one. So, like, did the patient take any medication? Did the patient take any medication for that uh, to relieve the symptoms? Actually, did it work? Did the treatment work? The example, for example, here, that's uh, headache symptom assessment. Some questions you might ask. The, for example, for symptoms, did you experience any other symptoms? Like the scholar, yes. Did you experience any nausea or vomiting? Do you have any sensitivity to light or noise? This, this, some, some of these questions uh, can would be able to you will sometimes helps to differentiate if it's a migraine or a tension type headache. Uh, if you are assessing a patient with headache, uh, characteristics. Please describe your headache. Is it throbbing, pulsating? On a scale of one to ten, how severe is your headache? How often do you get these headaches? Right. History. How long have you been having these headaches? Did this happen in the past? Was it different? What were you doing when you got the headache attack? Right. So and identifying triggers. When did your headache start? That's onset. Was your headache gradual or abrupt? Because severe headache could be a red flag, which is I mean acute 
onset with acute young, acute onset severe headache location describe the location of your headache aggravating factors what makes your headaches worse uh, remaining factors what makes your headache better how often do you take the headache medications because here we're assessing for example for medication overuse headache okay so that's the scholar symptoms It'll give you a good idea about the patient symptoms and defying also red flags so red flags these are situations where patients need to seek medical attention they are they may suggest significant pathology pharmacists should be able to identify the red flags okay we, are, we play a really important role as pharmacists to identify uh, red flags when patient comes to your pharmacy uh, and you need to decide you're going to refer to the patient MD or it has to go to ER as soon as possible. Examples of red flags, so similar to the example of headache, a uh, new onset headache at age older than 50 years, uh, new onset headache in immunosuppressed individuals, new onset severe headache in a pregnant woman, uh, new onset severe and abrupt thunderclap headache because it might indicate brain pathology like uh, subarachnoidal hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage or strokes increased frequency or increased severity of headaches headache in patient with recent head trauma significant change in the pattern of the headaches the patient is getting and the presence of other symptoms that indicate a more serious cause of the patient headaches okay these are examples of red flag for a headache symptom Okay. So for uh, a comprehensive information of uh, common symptoms you encounter in the pharmacy, chapters 4 to 11 in the Patient Assessment Clinical Pharmacy textbook, it does have uh, uh, good chapters about these, including questions about the red flags and what examples of scholar questions you might need to ask your patients. Okay. And this marks the end of this section. Okay, bye for now. Thank you.